Welcome to the Unscripted Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Conrad, and this show is where we hear the real stories from real people changing the world. From everyday people to the top celebrities, all the conversations are real, raw, and always unscripted. Thank you for joining me today. Now let's get to today's guest. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Unscripted One-on-One. Again, uh, special week this week. Um, depending on when you hear this or see this, uh, it's a little bit of a throwback. Um, this week is uh, Mount Vernon Nazarene University's homecoming week. And because of COVID, we had to uh, push things virtual. So um, decided this week to, to reach out to some people. And I didn't have to reach out very far for this one, about, about two offices over, I think, um, basically to uh, to get a guy, the man, the myth, the legend, someone people have been asking me to get on for a long time. Uh, let me go ahead and let him introduce himself and we will go from there. Hey, I'm uh, Justin Brown. I'm a 2013 grad of MVNU uh, for undergraduate, 2017 for master's program. And yeah, excited to be on here finally. So yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your family, because I know it's not just you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my wife, Ashley, is also an MVNU grad. Uh, she graduated in 2014 with an education degree, uh, ran cross country for Coach Chip Wilson, who's now the athletic director. And so we've got deep MVNU ties. Uh, uh, took the boys up there a couple months back and told them some stories. They're two and one, so they weren't listening to a thing, but uh, we, we fed them the stories at least. And, and uh, yeah, so... Judah's two and Jacoby's one, and and uh, that's our crew right now. And 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 Justin, let me just tell you that the day you walk them when they're not two and one, but when they're 16, 17, and you're telling them those stories, it's a little different. I'm just going to say, like, I'm just telling you, because I got one that's a sophomore there and one that has looked at potentially going there. As you know, we talk about this on a regular basis, but for our audience, um, yeah, it's a little different because I took Austin up there when he was maybe six, seven, eight years old. And Dave Parsons gave him a T-shirt that said MVNU baseball. And at that point, we had no clue that my guy would be wearing a uniform one day uh, for, for the NES. So I'm telling you now, just, you know, be ready. Be ready. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. So it, it's a phenomenal place. Um, my two older siblings went there. Um I, my parents met there actually in the sidewalk in front of Pioneer Hall. So it's a unique experience uh, going there as a student with that, that kind of deep history and tradition. My mom, as a, uh, I think like a 12 year old, was at the groundbreaking for the college when it was just a farm, you know, in Mount Vernon. And, uh, you know, so I, I love the place. It's a tremendous uh, place and, and uh, so thankful to have gone there. So. Well, so let's, let's start there. Do you want to start now and go backwards or do you want to start backwards and go forwards to where you are today? What's best for you? That's a great question. Let's, let's start at, at the beginning. Um, okay. you know, yeah. Like I mentioned, my mom with MVNU, she, uh, you know, had or MVNC at the time, um, you know, had, had a deep history. So really from, the time I was negative a lot, decades, uh, I mean, <laughs> you has been a part of my life. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, my parents met there. My mom was a two time homecoming queen. So kind of a Heisman trophy thing was talked about a lot in my family. Um, a lot of allegations though, she won it as a junior and I think won it as a senior. My dad has told the story many times and, you know, I know stolen elections is a hot topic, but she didn't actually get the honor. They gave it to someone else. My dad has many times shared that there was, it was rigged. And, and uh, so, you know, she's unofficially a two-time homecoming queen. Um, but, you know, it, I can recall as a kid going up to homecoming uh, events. I can remember going, you know, in middle school and, and when my siblings were there and, and watching some Cougar basketball games and seeing guys like uh, Kenny Chafin was a, just, I mean, if they would have had posters, I would have had a Kenny Chafin poster in my, my room. And even Chip Wilson, point guard, Steve Maves, the big, you know, seven footer as a center. And, and I just lived the place before, uh, you know, I, I was even coming into my own as an athlete. And, and uh, I can remember, you know, baseball, Coach Veal has always had those, uh, or he hasn't done them lately, but like a baseball card schedule. 
And I can remember being a, you know, freshman high school and looking down through, you know, that and, and uh, you know, we, we've had MVNU part of our family for a long, long time. So, so you're, and so did Steve Harvey like come out and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She, she didn't win. Did, did that happen or no? <laughs> Controversial. I, you know, it was like a back, a lot of backdoor um, dealings, I guess. And, and uh, my mom, blushes every time the story's told and, and uh it corrects that it didn't happen that way but my dad has been adamant i don't certainly don't want to cause any turmoil in the mvnu alumni community but um there's some heavy allegations going around uh, <laughs> that it was well, rigged so well honestly you know in four years i never got voted to mr mvnc and i always took that a little personal i mean sure. i i, I I campaigned pretty hard my last two years. I mean, it was, it was epic and um, never want, didn't even make it to court. So not even on the Mr. MVNC court. So, but here I am and, and here you are. So, anyway. Yeah. All right. So, so, and I know, I, I know your story. Cause again, we work together. So where did you decide in high school I want to go to MVNU. That was your only one. Or did you go through a recruiting process because you were, you were a pitcher, right? Um, what was that like? And did you, did you have some other schools online too, or was it always MVNU and that's it? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I was a two sport athlete in high school. I, I wrestled growing up. My brother wrestled and, and was a wrestling coach. And so I was into that pretty heavily as a, as a high school athlete that really affected my weight and and uh, development physically. Um, so I, I was battling that di dynamic and, you know, I'm not that old, but even back then the, the recruiting process wasn't what it is now. It wasn't on people's radars to pursue it, um, you know, in the early years of high school and things like that. So, um, you know, quite frankly, in high school, I wasn't very good. Um, so I, I think I had a dream of, of pursuing baseball at MVNU, um, you know, I wasn't looking at a lot of places. I think uh, Ohio Dominican was one other spot. I had a little bit of interest and went to a camp or something, was offered like a JV roster spot. But, um, you know, I was a late bloomer, truthfully. And, and, you know, as a senior at, in high school, it didn't have any real abilities. In hindsight, knowing what I know now, kind of recruiting process, I certainly would have not have recruited me, um, you know. So I really wanted to go to MVNU and, and give it a shot just because, Again, with the backdrop I had, I, I kind of idolized the program and, and uh, just loved what was going on there. And, and uh, my sister, who was five years older than me, had some friends who were baseball players at MVNU, and, and they'd come to the house down in Westerville. And, and uh, so it, it was always really what I was after. Um, so I, I remember going as a senior, the fall of my senior year, going, you know, and, and did a visit and did the whole thing. And threw a bullpen for Coach Veal and Coach Laszlo. Dick Laszlo was the assistant at the time, and Laz, he's a stud. Um, but I remember, I think I hit like 74 or 75 on the radar gun, which is a joke, uh, you know, for for that level of program and, and who they had in terms of arms at the time. And, um, you know, so I remember, you know, Veal radar gun, and, and I remember thinking, that's all I got. Like, this is it. Let's go. And uh, – he was cordial and sharp and, and things like that, but basically lined up like, if you're going to come here, you're going to walk on. Uh, we're not giving you a dime. We're not giving you, you know, anything. And, and I remember my dad and I hopping in the car and we were going down route three. And, and uh, we, I remember us looking at each other thinking like, that was all we needed. Mm. I just needed an open door. Um, like it, things are going to work out. Um, you know, I, I was going into that thinking he might say no. Um, and the idea that he left the door open and said, you know, you can come try out, we were good. And, and so I, I kind of had committed at that point to this is what I was going to pursue, finish wrestling and, and baseball my senior year. And and we got up there and, and got rolling. So that was kind of how we ended up at MVNU. But from a recruiting standpoint, it was non existent, truthfully. And so that's amazing considering what you do today, which we'll get to that because I think we're, we're headed that direction but um so given that now now walk me through you walk on at Mount Vernon and had a decorated career I don't want to give away the end of the end of the book before we open the the, the first chapter but we know you had a decorated career and 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 have gone on to since more and I don't want to steal all the thunder for the future so you walk on at Mount Vernon what was that like 
Yeah, so the process, um, again, walk-on tryouts occur, you know, at any college program, pretty similar, but it, I had about a six-week window um, where it was, hey, you're going to throw a live innings, you're going to practice, you're going to do the whole thing, and, and when the chips fall, we'll see where we're at. And uh, I remember moving in, and, and there were key moments in that fall that were difficult that you, you kind of get pushed and exposed a little bit. It was not a, a comfortable six weeks. I, I remember at the end of it thinking – I'm glad this is over with whatever happens happens, but um, you know, like things like, for example, you come in and, and they had some good players in the class that I came in with. And, and uh, I remember at an orientation, even the first weekend of the whole experience, you're already experiencing a hard transition moving away from home and moving in and all that stuff. But I remember, you know, some kid had transferred from another good college. He was coming into that same new student orientation and we had kind of hit you know, struck up some conversations because we were baseball guys. And I remember him in front of the chapel saying he had made a statement that I remember thinking, this is trouble if, if it's true. You know, he said, yeah, I was talking to Coach Beal and, and uh, you know, they're not going to take any walk-ons this year. He was on scholarship. He was like sought after. I was not. And I just remember there was like a group, two or three of us. And, and he had thought that I, I was also an established guy coming in. And I remember hearing that thinking, this is this is going to be a problem if this is true he sounds credible I don't I don't know his backstory he's talking a lot you know hindsight being he uh you know I'm not going to give the name away but he he proceeded for the next few years to be kind of a guy that just was a pathological liar transferred out one year later but at the time I didn't know that and I remember right. thinking this is a problem you know yeah. they're not taking walk-ons I'm coming to walk on apparently he knows something I don't this is going to be an embarrassing experience and we'll see how it goes. So I remember, you know, we got into walk on, you know, tryouts and, and inter squads and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I had performed in those scrimmages about like you would expect with what I had right? <laughs> before, uh, you know, I, I'm not a hard thrower. I was left-handed. So that was in my favor, but I was walking guys left and right. I had no put away pitch. I had, I really didn't have the stuff to be there truthfully in hindsight. And, I remember just kind of catching on with a few seniors, a guy, you know, named Jason Decker uh, was, a, I think, a senior at the time. Uh, Cody View, you know, was a, a junior or sophomore at the time. Uh, a kid named Caleb Wright was a year older than me, that, you know, and, and I just remember getting some encouragement from those guys as time went on that, you know, we're on the right path here, even though I'm getting lit up and balls flying <laughs> everywhere and I'm, right. you know, walking guys and things are not going well in that regard and and I remember feeling like okay the only way this is going to work is if I can prove to these guys and the coaching staff that I can be an asset to what's going on here because I'm certainly not an asset on the mound right now but from a team standpoint from a uh you know the whole package I got to make up some ground in those areas and and so when I wasn't throwing, I, I was running on the warning track and I made it a point, like when I show up, I'm not stopping. I'm, I'm not, I'm just, I'm going to be moving the entire time. I was the guy chasing foul balls. I, you know, I'm, I'm just doing every single thing I can do to prove that I can be an asset. And uh, cause I needed to, to, you know, prove that I belonged in this environment. And, and so we get through the six weeks of, of fall ball. And uh, you know, I remember some of those guys I had mentioned, you know, I was building good relationships with, and they, they kind of said in, in the individual exit meetings, hey, they're going to, um, you know, put in a good word for me or something like that. And, and I remember thinking, sweet, you know, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the coaching staff and, you know, wh how's it all going to land? And, and uh, I remember going into my individual meeting and, and Coach Veal basically saying, you know, uh, from a pitching standpoint, you, there's just no way you're going to see the mound here. Like, it's just not going to happen. Wow. And uh, certainly not this year but we'd love to have you around. We'd love to be on the team. You won't travel. You know, you're, you're going to, uh, you can dress for home games. You can practice and, and but you're not going to travel. And we certainly don't see you pitching this year. And again, it was just like, you know, that same experience on the visit with my dad. Like I, I remember thinking that's all I needed. The door is still open. You know, uh, I, I'm going through these checkpoints and the only thing you're trying to avoid is a no and a get, get out of here. Um, you know, and so it was a win. Um, so that, that ended up, you know, how the walk-on process went, um, you know, the next year I did redshirt and, and didn't see the field. I was making progress though. 
it's something about being in, in a positive culture and a good environment. We had some hard throwers. I mean, we had some dudes in the low nineties and, and I was just absorbed in like a sponge and was getting better. Again, the, the wrestling background, I was catching up in terms of development physically. I think in that year I came in at 160 and by the end of my freshman year, I was like 175 and, and uh, it's just getting into the, the, the right systems and the right culture and the right environment. And, and uh, so, you know, I was making progress. We get to the end of the year, end of the spring, we have another exit meeting. And, and um, I was curious how I was going to go because in some of our practices, I was starting to prove like, I'm not the same guy I was in, in September. And, and uh, you know, things were changing a little bit. I, I was gaining velocity and, and, you know, we get to that meeting and, and coach Veal again said, um, uh, next year, you're going to have to walk on again. Mm. Um, we can't guarantee you a roster spot. We've got arms coming in and, and, um, you know, it's been great having you, but you know, and, and that was the first time in the process where my mentality, I think, uh, changed. Yeah. I wasn't looking for open doors and, and, you know, avoiding no's anymore. I, I kind of started to feel like I was heading in the right direction. So truthfully, like I, and we've had many conversations, he and I about it, this isn't news, but I, I left pissed. I left like this is uh, this is um, we're in a totally different ball game now, and uh, y- you know, in in conversations he had has expressed that he was dangling a carrot on purpose, and 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 he does that with everyone, and this is just what how he's operating, and why he's so successful as a coach. But you know, it worked, um, yeah. plain and simple. So yeah. the, the next summer, um, I, I got after it even more, and I was already at a pretty high clip. You know, in hindsight, you look back and. I didn't have a lot going on. Uh, I, I worked in the summer. I played some summer ball. Um, I was pretty much obsessed with closing the gap between where I started and, and where our top arms were at. And uh, so we come back in the next fall. And again, I'm, in, I'm coming back with some relationships and, and you know, some, some equity compared to the year before, but still no guarantees. Uh-huh. You know, there's there no guarantee. It was if I lay an egg, if I don't perform, um, you're gone, you know? And, and yeah. so that fall, um, really this would have been the fall of 2009. Everything began to shift in the trajectory of my playing career. Um, I remember the first, uh, inner squad outing. I mean, I was on a mission. I had been on a mission since leaving Veal's office. Um, you know, when I was told I was going to have to walk on again. And, um, so that first outing in fall ball, you know, through two innings, so that's six outs. I struck out five guys. Um, and on the radar gun, I was up to 87. Wow. So it was like, all right, we're in a totally different ballgame now. And so systematically, that that fall, things started to change. I started to get credibility with guys. And uh, when fall ball was done, that next fall, so that's, you know, um, my sophomore season or second season, retro freshman season, I left fall ball in the starting rotation. Wow. Uh, I was the third starter out of the, the, the next spring. So – Everything kind of shifted at that point. Um, Long winded, but that, that was kind of the story. That's like Rudy, you know. I, I literally, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, I think anybody listening to this, and I hope, you know, again, I have no idea where this lands. <laughs> I don't know if, if my wife's the only one that listens, and God you bless. Probably tune me out after the allegations about the two time <laughs> homecoming thing, and I get it. So. <laughs> no, no, and thank God for my wife because she's the one person that I know listens uh, to all these, and 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 so she's probably on her walk or run right now and listening to this. And so shout out Heather, um, but that's like Rudy, man. If a young player is listening to this, that story because I you, you know this, you, you've been in this business a while. Uh, and we'll touch on this, I think, the next phase um, as, a, as a coach. You've seen this, man. You've seen we all get caught up in the rankings and the, the what team you play for and where you, you know, how many, man, now you got Rap Soto and you got this and you got that and you got numbers and exit view. Man, at the end of the day, there's a, there's a want to factor that can't be measured in a, and, and no disrespect to all that other stuff I just mentioned you know, shout out to Chris Valentine. We, we, we love PBR. We love those guys. Right. And we do. I mean, I, I know you need to get Chris on the unscripted podcast. I'm going to interrupt you there. He, he needs to get on. It's his uh, turn, right? He, he put a lot of pressure he, on me and you to get mentioned some on. things to me and I'm just gonna, I'm not going to blow the top off, but he's got interest and you need to get him on. So. All right. All right. We gotta, we gotta get, we gotta get Chris on, but shout out to PBR shout out to all that they do because at the end of the day, 
again, Chris Valentine, probably the most powerful guy in, in that world right now. Oh, he's the godfather of high school Ohio baseball for sure. So. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, PBR doesn't have a want to number, uh, as you just said. And again, I, no disrespect to PBR whatsoever. But any, any player listening to this, if, if by some chance it lands on some kid's podcast – or on their iPod or iPod. Do I have iPods even existing? iPhone, whatever, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hear this somewhere, hear that. The fact that there's a want to factor for every player. You could have walked out of Coach Veal's office that day and said, I'm done, I'm done. And unfortunately, I think you and I see this a lot in this business. A lot of players would say, I'm done. I'm going to transfer, I'm going somewhere else, or I'm just going to quit. And at the end of the day, you didn't quit. And, and so let's fast forward to your senior year. Give me all... How did you finish your, you finish your career decorated, correct? Uh, yeah, by some standards, for sure. I mean, um, so my, my senior year, I was the number one arm for MVNU and, and uh, was all conference and all region. And, um, but, you know, I, I think to tie the story, the stuff I'm most proud of in the playing is um, I was voted cat to my junior and senior year by my, my teammates. Uh, so Vio has always done that where teammates vote. And um, so I, I think, you know, the end game in hindsight that I see, you know, years removed was all of that process of getting better and, and improving and, and really chasing just being the best I could be like as a pitcher, pay dividends and, and just create a credibility amongst my teammates. And, um, you know, so that that's probably what I'm most proud of. And, and um, you know, but from, competitive standpoint you know I wasn't a walk-on and I never got uh showed the door you know I guess so yeah well at the end of the day and I should mention this anybody listening watching whatever um just you know JV's a humble guy I mean at the end of the day you're not gonna come out well I was this 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 and this. You're, that's not you so so in fairness let me just say you had a decorated career and what people really need to hear is you went from walk-on who could have walked out after your freshman year to being number one starter on the, on, on your senior year, that that's incredible. Like, cause every year there, you know, coach Veal is, is no slouch MV and you, as we would both, I think agree is definitely no slouch in baseball just cause they're NAIA. I think they're way overlooked. And again, I'm a little biased cause I have a certain right-hander that plays for him, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I mean, way overlooked, you went from walk on to, one starter and a captain on the team. That that's huge. That's huge. And it, and again, you're not going to say that because you're humble enough. I'll say it for you. That that's that's massive. Like that that's big time stuff. That's Rudy type stuff. That's the kind of stuff that they show on a Saturday. You know, before a football game, they highlight some kid, and everybody's like, "Wow, that's incredible." That's you, man. That that that's big time. So um, the legend of JB is 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 true. Okay. And, and so, um, and that has nothing to do with the fact that we work together. That's just true. Anybody else sitting there telling me that story, I'm going to say that that's, that's not every day, man. It's especially in today's culture, you know, this. And so let's, let's fast forward because you know, this as what your next role was, and that was coach. So talk to me about coaching a little bit. Yeah. So when I was done playing and, and um, you know, I wanted to get into coaching period, it it really started to become a desire my senior year and um you know I had always admired coach Veal and just saw how he operated and the level of success he was at and um one of his mentors Sam Riggleman was a uh, Spring Arbor's head coach and and uh, we would interact with them he's an ABC Hall of Famer so I, I kind of admired what they had going on and, and what coach Veal still has going on um the idea of you had a, you had a program of guys every year coming in and out the influence that they've had I mean Riggleman retired uh, with 40 years of head coaching experience, 40 years of leading a college team. So you, you do the math on that at 20 guys on average a year. I mean, so like I, I, I admired the influence they had and felt like this was the path for me. Um, and uh, so I, I transitioned from player to, to assistant coach for Coach Veal, um, became a grad assistant, got my master's degree and, and uh, was handling the pitching staff and, and uh, had a lot of influence in coordinating our recruiting and and uh, different things of that nature with the team. And, and so I was there for three and a half years, I want to say, as an assistant. In that time span, actually, I got married. And, and um, you know, so I think it was 2016, first opportunity to become a head coach came up. And, and um, I think actually never ready for a, a transition. We love him and you. 
but I had been there nine straight years at, at that point. Wow. You know, I'm that guy at homecoming where <laughs> you, you're still here, you know? So like, I think there was a lot that, uh, as much as we love the place, it was probably in our best interest to get new experiences and, and see things. And, and truthfully, the more we've done that, the more we've realized how great of a place it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so moved up to Minnesota and was the head coach at uh, North Central University, a division three school up there. And then uh, moved to Toccoa Falls, uh, Georgia, um, another NAI NCCA program and uh, was head coach there. And in that time span of moving around, um, Ash and I added Judah and Jacoby to the roster for our family and, and uh, you know, really started to feel a tug to get back to Central Ohio. You know, we enjoyed the places, we enjoyed the adventure component, but just the wear and tear of, uh, you know, you're enjoying your boys and their babies and, and this is a blast and other people you really love um, are seeing them twice a year. And it was just like, ah, this isn't getting it. And, uh, you know, so then the opportunity um, at Bo Jackson Elite Sports came open and, and um, next thing you know, we're up here. So been in the baseball, you know, realm here for a while now. Yeah. And, and so let me ask you that when it was, when it was coaching, because of your path and so let again let me just rewind here you went from a walk-on throwing 75 to the pitching coach after you graduate like that's a that's a huge trajectory you know what I mean like I don't think somebody's gonna reach down and go well, that kid's throwing 75 let's have him coach up our team like that that's that's it's a credit to your hard work and but it's a, it's a list if anybody listening to this and we're going to touch on what you do next because I think all this story supports what your passion has become and that's what you're doing now um but so you go from 75 76 ish to leading a pitching staff to coaching that man that's a that's an incredible trajectory you know that that's that's not normal i wouldn't say for most guys um so you go through all that now let me ask you this when you were coaching because you were that guy that walk on that kid that the rudy did you have a soft spot or did you have an eye for players that would come to your office and say, coach, I just want to wear a uniform I don't, or running the track, as you said, running the, what taking ground ball. Did you have an eye for that or a soft spot for guys like that on your rosters as you progressed? I think there certainly was, uh, you know, as I'm hearing you describe it, I immediately can think of guys that, yeah, you know, you, you have a sensitivity to want to include them. But I also think it, my experience in that worked to where I was probably harder on those types of guys on the roster. Um, because in really my entire coaching career, you know, through that lens was, you know, it was frustrating to see guys who said they wanted to maybe get in the starting rotation or wanted to become, you know, whatever accolade they, and, and I would think you have no idea how much it takes, you right. know? Right. And it's not like I got drafted at the end of the day, it was a small college career and all that, but I'm just saying that the progress, um, you know, that, that was available to anyone who would do the work, um, you know? And, and, and so like, I think I had a sensitivity for, the walk on guy, but I was also very hard on those guys um, because often, and I think this is true for all of us, what we say does not match up with what we're doing. What we say we want just, just doesn't align often with the life we're living and in pursuit of those things. And uh, I think in that regard, it was probably a, a reverse effect on those types of kids that, um, you know, because I wasn't just glad to be there. Um, right as a freshman and sophomore, it wasn't just, man, this is sweet. You know? Yeah. I do remember, you know, as a freshman, again, when Vila outlined that like red shirt, don't travel thing, I didn't know if I was going to get like a uniform. Like I didn't know if I was going to get gear. And I do remember again, a lot of, a lot of this, you know, was celebrated with my dad. You know, my brother had a huge impact as well, but my dad and I were really journeying this together. And I remember calling him and saying, you know, the day they handed out hats, I got a hat, like <laughs> no guarantees, you yeah. know? And it was like, man, like, sweet, you know, I got a hat. Because, again, you're, you're not sure if you're going to get left out of that kind of stuff and where you stand. But when you come from that and you put in the work and then your 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 position changes, your status on the roster changes, and I look at it and go, it's not like I, you know, was, was doing things that other people couldn't do. 
it was just a consistent choice to continue to make progress and move forward. And, and I think I, as a coach that always frustrated me with guys who weren't choosing to do that um, in some ways. So, well, it's interesting, JB, because, you know, the, the summer that Austin got to play, um, but he played two summers with BJE, but the one in particular was that junior year. That was that, that uh, recruitable year. That was the big summer. Right. So, you know, and I remember, talking about this around the office and I, I didn't play baseball growing up. I, well, I didn't play any, I was an international champion as you know. Um, right, but, <laughs> so, but uh, that being said, you know, the world's changed, but, but I, I think today's player, and I remember t- them talking about this around the office and it kind of had a light bulb moment for me. Today's player is playing three games that you see on that. That's a freaking amazing stadium or they're going down to Atlanta for a week or 10 days to play at perfect game and all these other remarkable places where back in the day, so to speak, you know, that was your championship game is you, if you were lucky, you got to play on a college field. Most of the time it was dirt mounds on the back of a high school field somewhere, you know? And I think that changes today's player in many ways. I mean, I don't know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not, that's not my side of the business. I'm not that wise, but I, I have to think having a son that was in the mix a little bit there, it, it changes like the, I don't want to say they're spoiled but you just said it like if a kid has played all of his weekend games that you see on a turf field with a brick out outfield or ivy or wherever else they're playing games today that I don't want to say they they don't respect hard work but what's there to work for and especially when you go on a recruit visit it's like yeah that's cool I played I've played him better. You know what I mean? And what, you know, this university is trying to get this kid to come play there. And in the meantime, in the summer, they're playing at places like major universities. Right. And again, no disrespect to UC gorgeous facility. My point is it is a gorgeous facility and not every kid's, you know, I I think it it, it takes away some of the shine. Would you agree? Yeah. I think there's a lot of um, discussion in the industry about those types of uh, dilemmas and um, you know, it, it is certainly, debated is this the best format for development is this best format for you know everything you're describing and and, you know identifying people with grit truthfully I think the trait we're talking about is is grit and I I you know having seen that transition and and um seen what it is now I still believe guys who are we you know in baseball they they call them dudes uh, you know dude um and a, a dude is always going to be a dude. Um, and so even with the amenities and, and the glamour and, and everything that uh, can be short-term fool's gold type of stuff, I still believe uh, an individual with character and grit is always going to rise. That's been true in today's day and age with rankings. That's been true in the 1950s and it'll be true 50 years from now. Um, right. And so I think there is some of that that I think, it, certainly people are motivated by uh, uh, maybe some things that are not going to transfer to college and, and, and things like that. But the same principles hold true. If, if you've got character and grit, your motor is always going to be running and, and um, you'll, you'll stand out even more, I think, than in the past. Um, so that's kind of my two cents on it, but I think you're, you're on it for sure. Well, you, you, so now you, you currently, your current role is player development. That's really your heartbeat. And not only that, but leadership. And so, um, you know, and, and I think anybody that's listening to this is going to hear the player development side. You, you clearly have got a, a track record from your own story to those that you've seen as a coach and, 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 you know, in your, in your journey and your travels. So let's forward now because I really want to make sure everybody gets this before we we close out and I, I appreciate you spending late night now because you got young kids and you got them tucked in and, and coming on late but um so let let's talk about stay the course a little bit because I know that's really 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 where your passion is and where your gift is I mean you you have grasped your giftedness and and it's stay the course so let's talk about stay the course if you if you don't mind tell me a little bit about what the, how that started and where you see that going yeah, uh, so it started about a year ago. Um, I had been bouncing ideas around. I had been writing, it, but not publishing uh, articles uh, in, in leadership development and, and around this idea of staying the course. And, and uh, you know, it, no doubt it, it has uh, ties back to my personal journey. But I think 
as I went through that journey, um, it really has high, given me a heightened awareness um, and, and as I look and, and scan the lives of, of leaders um, that are in positions that we admire and, and uh, they have a credibility. Um, I, I'm beginning to see as I study the life of, of leaders, uh, they've all got this same type of trajectory. Yeah. Um, they, they've all got, uh, you know, principles here that, that are part of personal leadership development. So, uh, you know, what I'm doing with my website, say the course leaders.com is not, you know, management or it's not, um, CEO type stuff. It's really, you know, how can you develop as a leader personally? How can I develop as a leader personally? So, um, you know, the big project right now in, in, in January or February, 2021, I'll be releasing my first book. I plan to write for many years. Um, this is not my end game is to, to publish this and be done. It's, I want to continue it for decades. Um, but my first book is going to be titled Stay the Course. And it really is getting at the heart of what I've identified as I've studied the lives of leaders up close and from a distance. Um, you know, four principles that you find in, in all leaders. That, that get to high levels. And, and number one, they start small. They're, they're not afraid of no guarantees. They're not afraid of uh, starting as the bottom person on the totem pole. Uh, number two, they embrace change. Uh, number three, they don't quit. Um, and then number four, um, they play the long game. So they're, they're, they're looking for decades long um, uh, of, of end goals. And, and so um, you know, I, I, I've studied lives of leaders. There's stories of leaders in the book, um, and I'm really, you know, excited to get that launched and get that going. And it real probably will serve as a, a you know, launch pad for some other things that will be coming to my website with online courses. And, and um, I'm teaming up with Marcus Williams, you know, Marcus, and, and yeah. uh, he and I are kind of merging a, a partnership. And that will all kind of go public here in, in December and January, but we're going to kind of continue to expand what we're doing. Uh, on the Stay the Course website and, and um, get some materials out there that, that can help individuals grow. So, Well, Marcus is also a veteran of the Unscripted podcast. Right, yeah. Um, so shout out Unscripted. No. <laughs> um, you know, you just said this. <clears throat> Excuse me, something in my throat. Um, you just said this, but what a time to have something in your throat on a podcast. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and not COVID. Um, <laughs> I mean, choked up because my mom got robbed at the homecoming. I get it, you know. <laughs> no, you. So you just said, and I, I assume you know this, right? I, it's your book, but you just those four pillars that you just talked about. That's your story, right? I mean, that's your yeah, story. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I, it's absolutely your story. So, and and let me for anybody listening to this, understand. I walked into JB's office probably his first day on the job. And he's got his bookshelf set up and it looks just like my bookshelf at home. Like we, we, we study and read and follow and, and um, appreciate, I think a lot of the same type like Tony Dungy, right. Um, uh, it's just one to name it. You know, one of my probably top five favorite books is, you know, courageous leadership. I mean, you know, one of my top five favorite books is, is um, quiet strength. Like those, those type of books were the same thing that were on your bookshelf. So, let me testify to this guy's character if you haven't heard it already, but also he's a student of leadership. And so, but what, what I'm, what I'm just stunned about here is as you took those four, you talked about those four things, that is your story. And I don't know if I, I don't want to steal your book. I haven't seen your book. I haven't seen your manuscript, but I, I got to assume in a way you're telling your story because that, that is those four things. And, and, you know, um, I'm excited. I'm excited for Stay the Course. I really am. And, and if anybody's listening to this, it's staythecourseleadership.com. Is that right? Stay the Course Leaders. And uh, the best way, if you'd like more information, is just go to staythecourseleaders.com backslash subscribe and uh, get you information through my newsletter. Won't spam you. If you want to unsubscribe, that's fine too. Um, so, but that would be the best way. And unlike me, you don't post like every single day and 17, 18, 20 times a day. It's once a week. So he won't yep, let, goes out let your inbox, right? Tuesday mornings at 6 a.m. And that's it. So yeah. Now. And it's great stuff. It's it's not just a quick hitter just to get through the week. It's it's very thought out. It's very thorough. Uh, it's studied. You know, it's it's from what you're reading, from what you're learning. And, and that's the thing. I think you're you're always a student. You're always learning. And all of us are. But um, I know that you study and read quite a bit on and, you know, 
really pour in and invest into this. So I'm excited for the book. I'm excited for where this is going to go. Love Marcus. Uh, love Marcus. Yeah. Love the partnership. Love it all. Uh, it's great. So um, let, any, anything else you want to share before, before we close out, um, you know, just about where you're headed, um, what you've learned, any last nuggets of, of uh, inspiration before we check out? No, I mean, I, I think uh, 2020 has been such a tough year for everyone. And, and I think what it is doing and we're all experiencing it is just revealing the systems you've got in place internally. And uh, there's never been a better time to double down on, you know, character and the long game driven mentalities. And, and uh, so I, I'm wanting to kind of deposit into that space. And, and um, I, I'm trying to grow in that big time. Well, JB, I'm, I'm glad you came on today. I'm glad that our friend Chris Valentine pushed and pushed for you to come on today. Uh, I'm glad you're an alum, but, you know, and, and you should have a couch in your office. I didn't mention this yet. You should have actually a couch in your office for the amount of times that I, I drop in and, and we have a little therapy session, and whether it's my, you know, right-hander that's at Mount Vernon or leadership or anything else, man, you, you, you've invested in me and um, I'm a better man today because we get to work together every day. Like, and that, that's just truth. That's not podcast talk. That's truth. Um, I'm a better man today. I, I, I learned from you and your wisdom and uh, I, I just appreciate your, your level headedness um, in, in, you just said it like 2020 is insane. And a lot of us are losing our minds and you know what I mean? Time here over there, just chill, you know, like, Hey, you know, we're going to do this. And it's just, that's an exterior, uh, so <laughs> that's not reality, you know, that's the next, we're all navigating this thing and, and, uh, that, that's just what comes out, but that's not how I feel most days. So I'm with you hundred percent. Well, that'll be the next book. You can talk about how to be chill in the face of 2020. Sure. Yeah. Credit, credits. You know, I, I, I a little, little. Uh, what do they call yeah, it? We'll we'll get you my way. <laughs> sure. In the, in the front cover. Yeah, we'll get you set up. So. I don't want my face anywhere. Uh, but no, man, I, I appreciate you. I love you to death. Um, I'm glad you're a part of our team. I'm glad I get to to interact with you every day. And and uh, you know, stay the course. Leaders. Dot com. Right. Yep. And uh, you know, and and everything else is up there. So anybody that wants to find it can find it. Go Cougs. And I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, man. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you, man. See you. Yeah.